um, and participating in this. Uh, so for those of you who are not aware, but I think all of you probably are, we did the uh, MVP workshop um, uh, in, back in December. And this is another piece of the planning process that needs to be done. And it's a public listening session. Um, and we're basically just going to go through what was found out at that workshop, um, a little bit more background data on Hopkinton, and then solicit your input for what should be included in the report moving forward. So uh, feel free to speak up at the end and uh, contribute to the, the process. And if you have any questions, just type them in the chat so that uh, we can answer them in an orderly fashion and um, I'll then turn it over to Amanda. So. Thanks, John. Um, so I will just echo some of the logistic questions. Um, again, we are recording the presentation. It will be available online after this. Uh, comments and questions can be submitted through the chat and the way you function or that functions is there's a little um, button at the lower left hand of the screen and you can type in there. Um, and I have a link at the end of the presentation for an online survey as a follow up um, that is specific to some of the input that we're looking for, but we will have time at the end for any comments or questions or things that uh, people would like to discuss. Uh, so again, welcome all of you uh, for attending the public listening session for the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Process. Uh, we've been working with uh, core team members from the municipal staff and I've listed them here. And so I just wanted to give them a shout out um, along with some elected officials. Um, we've kind of adopted this idea that resiliency starts here in Hopkinton. There are so many things that start here in Hopkinton. Um, and resiliency could be that next thing. Uh, so leading the way in this field and really starting to incorporate it into everything that we do um, and realizing those co-benefits and, and getting more out of our investment, more out of our time, getting more out of our public spaces by really thinking about um, resiliency in everything that we do. Uh, so today's presentation will give just an overview of the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness uh, Program itself and of climate change in Hopkinton. Then we'll move into the strengths and vulnerabilities, priority action item steps, and these two bullet items will be directly relatable to the workshop that um, was hosted earlier in this process, and then talk about what are the next steps in the, in the MVP process. So MVP stands for Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness, and these are some of the leading principles of the MVP program. Uh, so it really does look to employ local knowledge uh, and to utilize that expertise. Uh, so even though this is a statewide program, it should feel something like it's really personal and unique to Hopkinton. It utilizes partnerships that are pre-existing in the community um, and leverages those existing efforts to build the resilience of the town um, and make the town even stronger than it is today. Uh, we use the best available climate projections and data. Uh, the state's doing um, a lot to advance these efforts. If you're interested in this, resilientma.org is a great place to look for more information beyond today's presentation. The MVP program really uh, prioritizes nature-based solutions. Uh, so these are things that mimic nature or utilize nature uh, to build resiliency. So for example, uh, wetlands can be a place of flood storage. Uh, and so either protecting uh, existing wetlands could be a nature-based solution or restoring some wetlands that have already um, perhaps been damaged to previous development or otherwise, and, and using that to our advantage to pilot potential projects and be proactive. Um, and to also think about some of our most vulnerable populations and how climate change will impact um, different people in our community differently and how do we make sure that everyone can be prepared. The MVP process has two different phases. Uh, the first phase is the planning grant, grant phase, so this big blue box. 
uh, which is the phase that Hopkinton is in right now. And the following phase is an action grant phase. So the MVP planning grant uh, uses this process to develop a list of priority action items that then will be eligible in the action grant phase. Uh, so there's a series of grants that are available um, up to $2 million in the action grants to do all kinds of projects. Here's just a few examples of the type of projects that are eligible. Uh, you'll notice that uh, community outreach and education is a big component um, of our planning process, but it is also a big component as in action grants moving forward. A lot of focus on nature-based solutions. Uh, there are some new categories and those are in the blue. So thinking about energy resilience, um, potentially land acquisition, uh, and then also partnering with low-income housing and mosquito control districts. In Hopkinton, we have leveraged the MVP process to also do an update to your hazard mitigation plan. A hazard mitigation plan is updated generally every five years. And by doing a hazard mitigation plan, Hopkinton becomes eligible for FEMA grants or Federal Emergency Management grants. Uh, so right now we're in, in development or we're developing a hazard mitigation plan alongside your MVP plan. Um, to create a joint document. Uh, and this will make you eligible for the state grants that I mentioned earlier and the FEMA grants. As a part of the MVP and hazard mitigation planning process, we convened close to 20 people to do a workshop. Uh, these included folks from the town staff, um, organizations in town, uh, some state staff, and other stakeholders. And we focused on four hazards and really identifying what are the vulnerabilities this, um, of these four hazards, what are our strengths uh, in being prepared or mitigating these hazards, and developing some action items across three different categories or sectors, so infrastructure, societal, and environmental. The four hazards that were chosen at this workshop to be sort of the most um, important to focus on were extreme temperatures, thunderstorms, heavy precipitation, and flooding, drought, and then severe storms, which included wind and snow. Going into the climate change data on these four hazards, uh, we've already started to see a change in temperatures so this data is looking back to 1970, and we've already started to see an annual air temperature increase, um, about a half of half of a degree per decade since 1970. And we've seen a particular increase in warmer weather in the winter time. Moving into the future. Uh, what this will look like on the ground is the days that we experience over 90 degrees, uh, so those really hot days, on um, the days that we would consider uh, contributing to a heat wave if we have more than one in a row, um, and then the days that fall below 32 degrees, or the days that we're able to experience snow or have that freezing, have those freezing temperatures. So right now, we have about six days that are over 90 degrees on an annual average, and we're projected to see this increase to 24 days um, by mid-century and 35 days by end of century. Uh, so that's about a month's worth of time that we'll see uh, the temperature be over 90 degrees in the summer. Looking at the days that fall below 32 degrees, Right now we have around 145 days um, of days on an annual average, and we see this number almost drop by 30 days or a month's time. So drop to 114 days by mid-century, um, down to 101 by end of century. And this has a variety of impacts. Uh, so in Hopkinton, I know that uh, the public health department has been doing a lot of work related to um, public health or 
insect-borne diseases and uh, vectors-borne diseases that are related to climate change. Um, so mosquitoes and ticks have been a real challenge. Um, and the public health department has been working with us to actually develop some materials related to tick education um, to try to get the word out about uh, that threat. Uh, and the other is impact that we've been seeing again are these heat waves and, and making sure that people have a place that they can go um, during the heat wave and making sure that they have a place to cool off. So moving into the extreme precipitation and thunderstorms. So we again have started to see a change in the type of rain events that we have seen um, in the past. So since uh, around 1960, we've seen precipitation during heavy events increase by more than 70%. So this is really looking at how much rainfall is falling um, per event and that's increasing. So it's increasing in intensity and the amount that we have those events is increasing in frequency. And we're likely to see this trend into the future. And these statistics show an increase in extreme precipitation events, um, about 8% by mid-century and 13% by the end of century, which of course leads to flooding. Uh, right now, these are just a few areas in town where flooding is currently experienced. Um, and the flooding around these areas could worsen with climate change. Uh, and the areas um, that I also want to point out as a, could be of particular interest are things related to stormwater. So on the left-hand side towards the bottom, I've listed a few areas where culverts are undersized. So we historically had been designing some of our systems for storms of the past. Um, and moving into the future, we want to be thinking about what will the design storms look like into the future. Uh, talking about severe storms, so again, wind or snow, uh, usually these events can be very costly and disruptive. Uh, Power outages are generally one of the top concerns related to this. Uh, also, we're talking, to, um, wanted to point out that we have been seeing an upward trend in North Atlantic hurricane activity and, nor and nor'easter activity, which again brings those heavy winds and can lead to power outages. Uh, drought was the last hazard on our list. Um, we are likely to experience more droughts into the future. And these droughts won't be like the droughts that we hear in the news in California and Australia, for example, but they will um, occur in smaller periodic um, events. So uh, lasting about one to three months, um, but typically in New England and in, New Ma in Massachusetts, we see a steady amount of rainfall each month. And so this will really change when we don't have um, rain for three months. It, it could really impact things such as water supply, um, trees, and other ecosystems. And uh, some of those water bodies uh, that may be stressed by not having as much rainfall. So here are some impacts of changing precipitation. And I mentioned a few just now. Uh, so the droughts weakening root systems thinking about increased pollutants into water bodies, and just the other stresses that we could have related to flooding, such as erosion, um, and the impact on other infrastructure. Uh, so now I'm gonna move into some of the results from the workshop, and I'll pause just to see if anyone has any questions um, related to the climate change impacts. I just had a question about um, the mosquitoes. I guess I'm I'm concerned about the bees too, and I'm afraid things that we might do to prevent mosquitoes could harm the bees. That's just a thought I had. I wanted to ask more. Yeah, thank you. Um, I can sense the I would have the same concern. I think 
some of the work is also thinking about what we can do. Um, so making sure that we're going, if we're going hiking, we're going out covered. Um, also thinking about the days and times that we're choosing to be outside. Uh, ensuring that our drainage basins are getting cleaned out so we don't have standing water. Uh, thinking if we do rain barrel collection, making sure there's a lid on that. Um, so some of the outreach that could be done related to mosquitoes potentially wouldn't have that same impact on bees. If anyone else has things to add, please feel free to chime in. Um, and I'll move on to the strengths and vulnerabilities if we don't have any other questions or comments. Okay, great. Uh, so here are some vulnerabilities and strengths that were listed in the workshop. Uh, you'll notice that a lot of things are listed as both a vulnerability and a strength. And this is really because there are things that are essential to our everyday services and operations. Um, and if they were to be impacted, um, it would become a vulnerability. Uh, so in some cases, there were things that were listed as both. Um, so DPW and the equipment and the services they provide, uh, the fire and police station, the schools, uh, communication infrastructure, um, and some of the vulnerabilities uh, I'd like to point out here that relate back to the climate threats that we just talked about um, were water supply and the wells. So thinking again, how's the drought impacting um, our access to those and then power lines um, and pipelines. So thinking about uh, how winds and, and other hazards will impact the operation of these. Uh, and shut down some of our um, electrical grid. Some of the vulnerabilities and strengths related to the societal features. Uh, potentially, uh, in some areas of Hopkinton, people felt that some residents might be more isolated than others um, and might have fewer access roads to get in and out of their homes or out of their neighborhoods. Uh, and there was a lot of talk about vulnerable populations. Um, and this is really, you can see in the next column, a lot of vulnerable populations were also viewed as strengths um, and bringing a lot into the community. So I think we um, were earlier talking about schools and youth being um, resourceful and being able to help in communities and teach us things that um, such as technology that we might need help with, um, but if they um, happen to be isolated during a, during a hazard event, they might be more vulnerable. Um, seniors are another on our list that often come up when we start to talk about heat. Um, Heat-related illnesses are common in youth and seniors. Uh, and so just making sure that they have a communication network, a support network, um, but also using their experience and their knowledge um, and capturing that so that we um, aren't reinvent reinventing the wheel and using the knowledge that we already have in the community. Uh, and the volunteers and the community groups in Hopkinton were really viewed as a top strength. Uh, environmental vulnerabilities and strengths. Uh, generally, the topography, the natural resources, the wetlands were really seen as a strength here in Hopkinton. Uh, and then vulnerabilities, uh, we're looking into hazardous waste sites, um, thinking about the wildlife population and how some of these hazards might be more impactful to them, uh, thinking about um, protecting some of the places that might be more likely to create hazard is, or be impacted and create chemical spills like an LNG facility or a landfill. Um, and really being aware that these things are there, fortifying them and making an action plan to address it, um, to address it in mitigation or in response. The town of Hopkinton is already doing a lot to uh, 
related to hazard mitigation, and some of those are listed here on the screen. Uh, so thinking through, um, or they already have a comprehensive emergency management plan. Uh, they participate in FEMA's National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, thinking through uh, the snow removal and disposal, um, and they have enough capacity in-house to do all of this consistently. And, and so these are some of the things that we reviewed as a part of the hazard mitigation plan to really look at the capacity of the town and make some recommendations on where improvements could be made. And now I'll move into uh, the high priority action items. And so, uh, again, there was this real focus on incorporating nature-based solutions and climate projections. Um, and some of the ongoing projects, such as the Main Street improvements and stormwater upgrades, are, are eligible candidates for this and make sense to sort of imp to implement some of these actions and thoughts uh, immediately. Another action item was to assess the inventory of stream crossings, um, such as culverts, and, and where these need upsize and where they're vulnerable and and if they were to fail what would be the impact on the town uh, to create an asset management and capital planning system that incorporates climate resilience and ensures that the projects consider co-benefits um, and also incorporating resiliency measures into other plans such as the Hop Hopkinton master plan um, and implementing some of the measures that have overlapping priorities. Um, and again, this is really utilizing the resources that we have um, and addressing some of the issues that we know that are pre-existing. On the next slide, it uh, captures some other uh, components that, that were high priorities. So looking at the senior center and housing authorities capacity to shelter in place um, I think probably right now a lot of this is being completed as we speak um, because we're seeing the need to really stay in our homes um, with COVID-19. Uh, the next bullet is acquire land for flood control uh, or wildlife habitat corridors to protect wetlands and open space. So this is really utilizing nature and the benefits that it provides um, to mitigate against hazards and ensuring that we have that uh, in the long term. There was an interest in building in energy resilience, so either adding solar canopies or thinking about the creation of a solar overlay district. Uh, the next bullet point, again, is thinking about how do we get on the forefront of some of this, so thinking about incorporating climate resilience into zoning and bylaws and regulations to ensure as new things are being planned uh, that they're taking into account climate change. And the last bullet here is to develop a comprehensive communication plan to reach vulnerable audiences, um, to include seniors, to include youth, to include limited English, um, limited English speakers, uh, to ensure everybody has a chance to be involved and, it, and that they're receiving the messages that are important uh, to public health and safety. Uh, so those were our high risk priorities. Uh, these next priorities were ranked at, uh, more at a medium scale uh, and I've divided them by categories. So infrastructure related priorities would be to conduct a resilient drainage assessment. So again, a focus on the stormwater management system complete um, a dam restoration, incorporate green infrastructure into the schools, provide training to town staff on how to uh, construct green infrastructure and how to maintain that infrastructure and just increase the town staff capacity overall. The societal priorities uh, were linked to ensuring that the school had everything that they need um, and that they were regularly testing generators, um, ensuring that they had the capacity and the resources uh, that they need to be prepared. Uh, there was some talk about expanding the public transportation system um, and pickup services for some of the elderly uh, populations, the youth, low income, um, and to win it, 
to within one mile um, is related back to there was some talk around the commuter rail station um, and ensuring that folks would be able to get to the places they need. Um, then next bullet is the ability to offer virtual classes to students during extreme weather. Again, this is likely something that's ongoing now. Um, and so some of these have already been in progress before the plan has even been published. So we're already ahead of the game. Uh, and then the last bullet is to create a senior assistance program to provide services such as transportation, lawn mowing and shoveling, snow shoveling. Environmental priorities, uh, maintain and upgrade subdivision detention ponds, uh, using vegetation that will withstand drought conditions and warmer temperatures, um, develop a tick and mosquito management program, um, and potentially we could add into this that isn't harmful to the environment um, in other ways. Incorporate climate resilience into MS4 requirements. Um, the MS4 is a permit um, that the town has related to storm water, and there are lots of requirements to look at um, things that contribute to water quality. Uh, and there is a real overlap and opportunity to leverage here and to use these existing efforts. Um, develop beaver management plans. Uh, there are several areas in town where beaver dams cause flooding and from the waterways. Um, work with the state land trusts, the Sudbury trustees, Charles River Compact on joint projects um, with communities downstream or in the region. Uh, develop a robust tree management plan and to update the open space plan. So those were the priorities that came out of the workshop. Um, I am going to talk quickly about this survey and then I'll open it up to questions or comments. Uh, so if you are able to follow this link, um, or we'll send out a link in the chat in a minute. Um, but if you visit this link, you'll be able to take a survey and provide some feedback and your thoughts and some of the topics that we covered today. So for example, I'm commenting on the vulnerabilities and the strengths and, and the priority action items and providing your own to be uh, included in the list if you so wish. And this will be available um, likely, we're hoping to leave it up for two weeks once we get the video posted. Uh, and so probably around April 3rd will be the last day to take the survey, but we'll continue to update the website as we learn more. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments on the presentation? I did have just, I can put it, my comments in the survey too, but I was thinking of wanting more public transportation and making the senior housing and affordable housing more resilient. Are, are we also including business in that? Because I know a lot of people, it's hard for them that the supermarket that used to be downtown is gone, mm -hmm. um, that they used to be able to walk there from the senior center and the, from the senior housing, but now they can't. So anything we could do to attract the types of businesses that would let people you know, walk from their homes. Yeah, that's a good point. <clears throat> we um, we always talked about accessibility to services and food and, and stuff like that, but um, I think one of the things we, we may not have looked at is how economic development and land use decisions play into that resiliency. Um, so it's something we can definitely look into. Thanks. Um, so the next steps in our process uh, is that we are working on finalizing the draft report that we will be posting online for public comment. Our goal is to have it online April 3rd through the 17th. Uh, so once we close the survey on, on April 2nd or 3rd, then the next step will be available to the public to review the draft plan and to have um, to comment on the draft, uh, comments can be sent to John and his contact information is here. 
And so I hope that you all will take a look at that and and provide your comments on our report. And, and that's the end of our presentation. Um, and I will quickly stop sharing my screen so I can add the link for everyone into the comment section in case you want to quickly just go there immediately to take the survey. You'll have that access. And I want to thank you all again for joining us tonight. Uh, and I'll be online if you want to stick around and talk a little bit more. Um, but if everyone has kind of said what they would like to say, uh, I'll just reiterate that it's been great to work with John and the town of Hopkinton. Um, and we look forward to posting the draft plan. Yeah, I just want to say thank you to Amanda and Weston and Sampson. They've been they've been great partners on this. They've been doing some great work, and we appreciate their help. Um, the plan is to get this recording posted on HCAM site. I've reached out to them, and hopefully we can do that. Uh, we will also be hopefully distributing the PDF of the presentation with the link, the clickable link, uh, to the public. And so we'll get a little bit more input that way. But um, if you guys have any ideas, please let me know. Excellent. Well, thank you, Amanda, for the, for the presentation. And, John, thanks for uh, letting me know about it and getting the info out there for it. Uh, this is very insightful. Glad to see this is all being reviewed. And, Amy, uh, you can share the link now. That's fine. And just from the youth and families' perspective, I mean, I think everything that's happening that we're going through right now ties in. So this is timely. Um, and, and thank you. Thank you, John. I know we're all learning so much now that will be useful into the future. All right. Um, thank you guys all for coming out. And I will see you all at some point in the future. We'll see you when. Yeah, exactly. It was a real struggle getting out here, you know, John. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Have a good night, everybody. Good night, everyone.